On July the 4th, 1976, the United States celebrated its 200th birthday. In my family, that's always been a... In the late 1970s, there was an uneasy feeling that perhaps the nation's best days were over. America's prestige in the world had been tarnished in the Vietnam War. The Watergate scandal had eroded people's respect for their own leaders. And the 1973 oil embargo had sapped the economy, causing a baffling combination of high inflation and high unemployment. Faced with these setbacks, which thwarted expectations and undermined many dearly held beliefs, can our government be decent and honest and purposeful and compassionate and filled with love? Can it be a source of inspiration and pride? In the 1976 presidential race, an obscure candidate tried to restore trust in government. All right. My name is Jimmy Carter. I'm from Georgia. I'm going to be your next president. You hope. I hope. My mother yes. had said to me all along, he's going to be president. And I said, Mom, I said, I said, I've never lied to you. He said, he's going to be president. I see it. Jimmy Carter was a one-term governor of Georgia and a peanut farmer from the town of Plains. With his strong Christian faith and sense of moral rectitude, he represented the traditional values that so many Americans seem to have lost touch with in a decade of upheaval. But even as he campaigned against the mistrusted Washington establishment, he faced an uphill battle against voter... That it's one of the appeals of the feminist movement. As women demanded a better role on a larger stage, a growing number of them decided to abandon their roles as housewives for paying jobs. In the domestic upheavals it often caused, a full half of American marriages ended in divorce. In the 1970s, it sometimes seemed that everybody was going in their own, often unorthodox, direction. Let us create together a new national spirit of unity and trust. But like explorers of unmapped territory who long for the familiarity of home, Americans elected a president so together, who represented traditional small-town values, Jimmy Carter. On Inauguration Day, the new president set out to prove that all Americans were his neighbors. Well, this is a first. The president and his wife out of the car walking their support. We had never seen the president get out and start walking down, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue. And, and the people just screamed, and we were cheering on the TV. He's talking about it being the people's inauguration. He wants to be with the people. He is one of the people. It was very refreshing. I think President Carter brought to this country a whole feeling of hope. Hopeful as it was at the start, the new administration was about to face a series of debilitating challenges. In 1977, the nation suffered through the coldest winter in 40 years. We were buried for weeks in, in Niagara Falls. We built tunnels all through our yard, so it looked like a, a mouse's maze underground that led to the street, although we didn't know where the street was until we hit the curb. The first couple days, it was okay, but then after that, the store had no supplies, and so it was much more difficult to, to get food and stuff for the kids and, and the family. The extremely cold weather this winter has dangerously depleted our supplies of natural gas and fuel oil and forced hundreds of thousands of workers off the job. President Carter flew to Pittsburgh to show his sympathy with those put out of work by energy shortages. The continuing crisis, he said, meant sacrifice for the entire country. If we can get everyone in this country to cut down drastically on heat consumption, we can keep tens of thousands of Americans employed. Now, I've got on heavy underwear. And uh, the White House is cold inside. But uh, we've gotten accustomed to it. And I hope that all 
the people in this country will realize that we're in it together. The American belief that nature could supply and sustain limitless industrial expansion was severely shaken in the 70s. A lot of Americans have known nothing but growth, 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 growth. And we come to think of the United States as invulnerable. And we suddenly found out that we were much more vulnerable than we had ever thought possible. In the 1970s, the United States found itself squeezed not only by energy shortages, but by old adversaries. West Germany and Japan were now challenging American competitiveness in everything from steel to electronics. It was hard to get used to, especially in Detroit. Ever since the end of World War II, Americans' love of big cars had made Detroit the heart of a massive industrial surge which lifted millions of Americans into the middle class. I thought the world had opened up for me because I had an automobile job. They were hiring the unemployables. We really could get a job uh, to get that American dream, to get a house, to get a brand new car, to really be able to take care of your family. The car industry in America built cars for Americans. And Detroit said, you will buy what we produce. We know better than you do what you want, and therefore we'll produce what we know you want, and then you'll buy it. They just kept building those big, huge cars. An average car uh, was receiving somewhere between 10 and 8 miles per gallon. This is LeBaron. I own one myself. With the character of a I used to pull it up in my driveway and go in the house and I could listen, and it'd still be drinking gas while it's parked. But German and Japanese state-of-the-art factories were turning out small, fuel-efficient cars with unexpected zip. The Rabbit, quicker from zero to 60 than a Jaguar XJ6L. People like myself at the time were really attracted to these cars. The new Datsun 200SX, five-speed stick, four-wheel disc This was good stuff. Besides which, the cars ran great, they had good fuel economy, and the quality was top-notch. By 1979, foreign cars had captured 25% of the American automobile market. To make matters worse, government regulations on safety, mileage, and emissions had sent the big three automakers reeling. Chrysler had acres of unsold cars and was struggling for survival. I relied on Chrysler for a job, and it was going to never end. Well, it did end. It was a devastating time for the industry. Thousands, tens of thousands of people were losing their jobs. My God, you could walk into the employment office and may not get in that day because so many jobs were lost. That's when I realized it was a step between me and the welfare line. They did lose homes. They did lose cars. They did have a lot of divorces at that time. And a lot of people picked up and left the city of Detroit. In fact, so many people were leaving at that time that a saying cropped up of, you know, the last person to leave Detroit, please turn out the lights. Millions of people followed their dream to states across the South where the oil industry was pumping at full tilt and new electronic industries took advantage of cheaper energy and non-union labor. They left behind a rust belt of obsolete industries, massive unemployment, and in some American backyards, a dangerous legacy of the country's decades of industrial prosperity. In Niagara Falls, New York, many people worked at Hooker Chemical. Chemicals to us meant a good economy. It meant that my husband was gonna to continue to be employed. It meant that our mortgage would be paid. Our children could have clothes and food on the table. It meant to us a whole lot of realities. But then in 1978, Lois Gibbs' two children fell ill. Michael developed asthma. 
and epilepsy, a liver problem, an immune system problem, skin problems, and then after a short while, Melissa got very sick too. And I asked the pediatrician, like, what is going on? And he said, I don't know, you just must be an unlucky mother with a sickly child. But then Lois happened to read an article about chemical dumps in the city of Niagara Falls. Over 20,000 tons of toxic waste from Hooker Chemical was resurfacing in a 3,000 foot long trench called Love Canal. Oh my God, this is the answer. My children are being poisoned residents were convinced that leaking poisons were causing an unusually high number of illnesses and birth defects in the neighborhood. Why can't you just move everybody for once? We're gonna go for Fear and months. anger turned workers and housewives into activists who demanded to be relocated at state expense. We work we work but the state would only pay to move the 239 families closest to the canal. As I looked down the street and saw all of the first families moving, I felt very jealous that they were able to leave. But my children were still sick. We were still trapped. More than 700 families were left behind in their now worthless homes. They turned their back on us, put dollar signs on our foreheads, and dismissed us like we were pieces of trash. The remaining residents kept arguing to be relocated, but after almost two years, their patience ran out. You just pass the word around. Nobody, we're not going to do anything violent. We're just going to keep them in the house. Nothing more than that. Body barricade the doors. Nobody else. They're all coming out, guys. This word just in, two federal environmental officials are being held hostage at the Love Canal Homeowners Association's headquarters. If it was so safe at Love Canal, then it was safe enough for them to live there until we all got out. So we called up the White House and said we were, we were holding two of your EPA officials here, and we were going to hold them here until we get evacuated out of Love Canal. President Carter today declared that prudence dictates the residents should be relocated. Here's to the homeowners and all our hard work. It was a big victory for Lois Gibbs and her neighbors. But as they made toxic cleanup a national issue, some 30,000 other dangerous waste sites were discovered across the country. Americans now had something new to fear, the very ground they walked on. I see. Whether that was the breakup of, of families, a uh, uh, great increase in, in crime and, and drug use, uh, uh, immorality, abortion. Conservative opposition to liberal policies intensified as more and more Americans became fed up with the strife caused by busing, abortion rights, equality for women, and equal rights for another group seeking public acceptance, homosexuals. In San Francisco, gays got political support from Mayor George Moscone and encouragement from the gay city supervisor Harvey Milk. But there was a shocking backlash to gay liberation on November the 27th, 1978. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. The killer was Dan White, an anti-gay city supervisor who'd resigned from the Moscone administration but wanted his job back. I'm very confident that I will be reappointed to my job. But he was not, and he took revenge, killing Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Milk. That night, 40,000 people came out to the streets of San Francisco. Traffic stopped. Uh, people would talk to each other. People would cry. And there were a lot of straight people who were so galvanized by the gravity of this, they said, oh, I get it. I get it now. It broke your heart because of what happened to cause that, but it did give one hope. 
At White's trial, the so-called Twinkie defense, temporary insanity caused by stress and too much junk food, got White a sentence of only seven years and eight months. When that verdict was announced, all I could think and scream out, I was at home, I said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. We marched to City Hall. There was property damage. You know, there was no loss of life. There was expiation of anger uh, and seeking of justice. I think we really showed, don't mess with us. What some liberals saw as a corrective to injustice, some conservatives saw as signs of a disintegrating nation. Pastor John Hinkle of Los Angeles. That's when the Lord spoke to me and uh, said, I want you to go to Washington May 1st, 1979 with 100,000 people. I just said, oh, Glenn, we've got to go. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, there is spreading across our land today. A Believing that she had been born again and saved, Marilyn Norda says she wanted to save her country. The point was to pray for America, knowing that as we cried out to God, he would hear our prayer and that America would turn. Praise God. And oh, what a beautiful sight. Don't curse what the darkness, beautiful. light a candle. And so we began to think about how we could use this crisis as an opportunity to turn everything around. Praise you, Jesus. Many religious leaders had influence far beyond their local community. We began as conservatives in outreach to them, putting together the moral majority. We will be the alternative to the Carter administration. I would like to offer a toast at this time. At the very beginning of 1978, President Carter was the guest of the Shah of Iran. Because of the great leadership of the Shah, Iran is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. Iran was anything but stable. Within seven or eight days, there were riots already in Iran. There was shouting in the rooftops, Allahu Akbar, God is great, down with the Shah, Magba Shah. One really cannot understand how much Iranian people hated the Shah. And now they wanted the Ayatollah Khomeini, who had inspired so many of them with taped sermons from his exile in France. A year later, the Shah, whose secret police had spread terror across Iran, was forced to flee the country. Jubilant Iranians welcomed back Khomeini. It was as if the um, Messiah had landed in Iran. The 78-year-old cleric wanted to rid Iran of Western influence. He called the United States the Great Satan. He inspired fervent anti-Americanism in millions of Iranians. The loss of an important ally to an unyielding enemy was just the first blow in a series of misfortunes that confounded Americans in 1979. In March, America's worst nuclear accident caused a radioactive release at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. The near meltdown shook people's trust in American technology and the development of a new domestic source of energy. By June, energy problems became a national crisis after the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, raised oil prices by 50%. We were upset and we were frustrated and, and we were, just didn't seem like anything was working for, for America. Everywhere, gas lines grew longer and tempers shorter. The country was getting desperate. Enemies. By the end of the year, the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan and Ayatollah Khomeini had trapped Mr. Carter in the White House. On November the 4th, 1979, word reached Tehran that the Shah had been granted asylum in America. 
that morning, I looked at my window. Um, Iranian students had been climbing over the walls of the embassy with photographs of Khomeini on their chest and yelling, Marg Bar Amrika, death to America. They um, made a beeline straight to my office. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. The Americans inside have been taken prisoner. I was tied up, uh, blindfolded. I started to think about family and started to think about would I live through the rest of, of the night. For quite a while, we didn't know that Barry was a hostage. When I first got the State Department on the phone, they were unsure of exactly what, was, what had happened. They weren't sure how many people were being held. Week after week went by. Finally, at Christmas, the Iranians allowed a visit by American clergy. They let cameras in. We saw Barry come out, and he had a big smile on his face, and we were kind of sitting there laughing because he was collecting all these oranges, you know, and, and fruits and whatever he could find. We all felt rather good because he looked good. Little did we know that they had been kept tied up to chairs 24 hours a day. The continuing crisis was punctuated with daily displays of hatred orchestrated for the American news media. Unless the Shah was returned to Tehran for trial, Ayatollah Khomeini refused to release the hostages. At church, people would say a prayer for the hostages. Yellow ribbons uh, was in my house, in my neighbor's yards, and people had yellow ribbons everywhere. There were thousands of letters coming to the embassy. When I received a letter from Barbara, um, it was almost a religious experience. <laughs> I would take the letter, I, I, I put it down, uh, face up, and then look at it for a while. It was this, this little snippet of their life. Read it once, then read it twice. Must have read it 20 or 30 times. But I couldn't get enough of it. like the United States to, to rescue you, either bombing Iran or possibly invading Iran, or the John Wayne syndrome. But I, I knew that that was absolutely ridiculous. April the 25th, 1980. I was sleeping peacefully. The phone rang. I picked it up. It was Pat Cadell, the president's pollster shouting, uh, what's going on, what's going on? Uh, and I said, well, I don't know, you tell me. And he said, turn on the TV. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran. Two of our American aircraft collided on the ground. I, I just remember being so blown, I mean, so stunned. I mean, just so sick to my stomach. Here we are, the most powerful country in the world, and you, the images, the helicopters there. There was no fighting. There was no combat. But to my deep regret, eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. To think that eight other Americans had given their lives, it was totally devastating. I found an Iranian newspaper, and I translated it to everybody in my cell. We all sat there, glassy-eyed, and we didn't speak to each other, because we knew that other people died for us.
the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid, New York. Up ahead to Malchev. Malchev on a breakaway. Malchev gets it by Craig to give the Soviets the lead. The underdog U.S. hockey team is struggling against the Soviets. At the end of the second period, the Soviets lead 3-2. to two. So Mushkin tested only once thus far. The Americans with perhaps their final... In the run. final period, the Americans tie the score. Big shot for David. And then with minutes left in the game, America goes ahead. Tension rises as the clock ticks down. In a political rivalry played out on the ice, the United States defeats the Soviets. After coming off of 10 years of America being ridiculed and defeated and our views and our values, uh, our dreams all called into question, it just made you proud to be an American again. Pride would become an issue in the election year, election year of 1980. President Carter, still trying to negotiate freedom for the hostages, did not leave the White House to campaign. The humiliation of the lingering hostage crisis, combined with a deep recession, amounted to political disaster. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Enter Ronald Reagan, a Hollywood actor and two-term Republican governor of California. He was the epitome of America. He was the optimist, the can-do. You know, today is great and tomorrow is going to be better. I aim to try and tap that great American spirit that survived several wars, survived a great depression, and will survive the problems that we face right now. Ronald Reagan won in a landslide. Solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. Minutes after President Reagan took the oath of office, the hostages were allowed to leave Iran. After 444 days in captivity, they finally came home. disbelief, not knowing what to say, just, to, you know, no words, just, you know, tears and, and, and crying and hugging. It was a very moving time, yes. Broadway was so filled with confetti, I could hardly see my way through it all. And both Barbara and I were holding on to each other. It was one of those moments in life where you say, you know, it can't get any better than this. For millions of people, it seemed that America was back.